Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack a Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Hello, friends. It's Kirk Henderson and Josh Bo coming to you late Friday night, early Saturday morning, depending on where you are, following the Dallas Mavericks. Falling at home to the Los Angeles Clippers, one eighteen to one oh one oh eight. Josh, how are you? I am. I'm doing okay. Um, kind of, you know, not trying to be negative, Nancy, but it kind of felt like this type of game was on the table uh, because it's ba- like this game was the series, right? Like if the mm-hmm. Clippers had any backbone at all, uh, they would win this game. So. I kind of prepped myself for this possibility. So I'm not too bummed out, but there are definitely some things about how this game went that could be a bummer (laughs) and we'll get into it. So just as a quick recap for, for anybody who, you know, wants to live through this again, because (laughs) anybody listening to this podcast at this point, um, we tend to get far fewer listeners uh, on losses than we do wins. So anybody that's listening is probably somebody that really wants to commiserate. But essentially, Dallas started off scorching hot, burning the Clippers down. Luca left the game uh, on kind of a normal rotation pattern, and the Clippers went on a 14-0 run. And from there, it was Dallas basically trying to hold the tide from about the two-minute mark of the first two middle of the third or so middle of the second half kind of was was very grindy and they just weren't good enough um the entire team both on offense and on defense despite Luka Doncic having a career uh you know scoring performance and, and regulation he the the Mavericks just weren't good enough and the Clippers were borderline unstoppable um the question that we'll just debate a little bit is whether the Clippers were unstoppable because they were having one of the shooting nights that Dallas had, or whether the Clippers were unstoppable because the Dallas defense, despite, you know, a year of hype is really, really bad. Um, and I'm not, so, so let's just take it from there. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to win a lot of playoff games when you, your opponent shoots 58% from the floor. <laughs> uh, that's pretty bad. And then to top it off, uh, you know, they've hit 13, you know, they are pretty much unstoppable inside the three point line. And then they still made 42% of their threes. Um, there's definitely a sense of, you know, I'm seeing from fans and, and people online that think, oh, well, you know, they got beat by a hot shooting night, you know, nothing to worry about. And I don't think there's anything to, like, hugely worry about. I mean, the Mavericks are still in a great position. They get to play, sure. you know, when you're up to they're four. Up, they're up to one. Two it's, one it's... <laughs> and you get the game four at home. Like, I mean, you're you're in the driver's seat still. Um, but it is kind of funny how after the Mavericks won the first two games with some really crazy shooting, and I kind of tried to poke in and be like, you know, I don't know if this is sustainable, but if it is, you know, and people are like, oh, well, here's why it's sustainable, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, well, if, you know, why is it sustainable what the Mavericks did in the first two games and it's not sustainable, you know, I just think that's kind of funny. But the thing that would worry me the most about what the Clippers did offensively and how that could carry forward, there are two things, and they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, yeah. One, the Mavericks don't have anyone on the roster that can guard either Kawhi Leonard or Paul George. And sure. that's something that showed in the first two games. I mean, that's yeah. not, you know, that's not something that just happened tonight. That's happened all series. That's happened in the regular season for a lot of games. Uh, you know, maybe not the Paul George part, but definitely the Kawhi Leonard part. I think we have enough evidence that the Mavericks cannot guard Kawhi Leonard with this right. roster. Uh, same way that we have enough evidence that the Clippers can't guard Luka Doncic, to be frank. Um, and it's going to come down to the secondary guys and how well can each team 
limit that because it's it just feels inevitable that Luca and Kawhi are each gonna go off for 30 plus points in this series you know I mean that's just the way it feels and uh then you look at the Clippers and their secondary guy was Paul George gave him 29 points uh the Mavericks take your pick of who you want to say is their second best player if it's Tim Hardaway Jr he had 12 points on 14 shots uh if it's Kristaps Porzingis he had nine points on 10 shots and the Mavericks lose by by 10 so there's kind of the game and then the second part that I wanted to get to is that I mean the Clippers were at the basket and in the paint um they were 17 to 20 in the restricted area i mean i don't know about you but layups feel like a sustainable shot um like yeah no they were so like uh and the mavericks have had trouble guarding the rim at a lot of points this season and so so that's the thing that that can be worrisome and the thing about the rim defense and I tried to be very delicate about this because Porzingis is going to take a lot of heat in this game. He just should. And he should. should. But but this specific instance, when we are talking about team defense at the rim, it is simply not all on him. Mm -hmm. Like Dorian, who is a is a warrior, let's not mince words. Like I want to be critical and fair. He was terrible. He was terrible. This was the Dorian that I often complain about where they put him on lockdown stuff. Paul George had him on skates. Now, granted, Paul George is very good. So I don't really, maybe maybe I'm being too harsh, but it's one of these, these things that I have a hard time understanding why Dallas sort of did what they did for so long with, you know, Richardson didn't get much of a chance to play. And then when he did, he was pressing. And I would have liked to have seen Richardson get, get some earlier look, at least on, on George, um, to try to stop him. Cause George was outstanding in that first half. Like Kawhi will, will get most of the shine for kind of executing the, as more and more as the game went on. But Paul George was hitting the kind of shots that defenses are like that the defenses nowadays are supposed to, to go for and I, the mid-range stuff is really impressive but he was also getting to the rim at will and if you get to the rim that much at will while shooting free throws that's a team defensive lapse top to bottom and it starts with all the Mavericks players getting beat on single dribble moves it's the stuff that we've talked about all year I don't understand why Dallas tracks blow buys if they don't improve <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and I don't know what you, you know, like this isn't like a schematic, you know, there's schematic things you could do to maybe make up for it. But like, if you can't stay, like if you just basic principle of defense can't stay in front of your man one-on-one, like that puts your team at such a disadvantage that it is hard. Like you can scheme and you can try and you can use smoke and mirrors. But if you, if you just can't flat out stay in front of your man one-on-one, uh, that's a problem. Like that's a yeah. problem. Uh, Paul George was, uh, I'm looking at it now. He was seven of eight in the paint, four, four in the restricted area, three or four in in the paint outside the restricted area. So we might need to do more on the restricted area stuff specifically because I mean, conversation, I want to be very like, you know, we're going to lose the thread. It's not like you and I control (laughs) the conversation, but when I talk about this game, um, I want to be very specific about kind of what happened there because, you know, I, I want to circle back on KP, but I just, th- this sort of stuff is not solely on him. He was also very bad at it. Like both things can be true. Um, yes. And, and, but, but the team defensive concept stuff, they just have to execute better. Um, and, and I don't know. I All mean, right, keep going. I'll think, stop when talking. You, when you think of it this way, you know, Dorian, Finney Smith, and Maxi Kleba are probably not good enough individual one-on-one defenders to stop Kawhi and Paul George for a playoff series. And that's not a knock on either of those two because they really, you know, especially with Maxi, he gets the, I mean, Dorian gets shorter than the stick a lot with the assignments he has to play, but Maxi, like I love Maxi. He should not be guarding, you know, wing scorers. Like that's, that's a luxury for him that he's, he has the ability to at least move his feet enough to, to make it a, re- a reality. But, you know, his his strength when he entered the league, and I think when he's at his best defensively, is when he is an off-ball rim protector that can rotate over and block shots and guard the rim and, and do things like that and maybe then help and switch when needed. But, like, him having to guard a power wing from the perimeter for 35 minutes a night, it feels like, that's just that, – that shouldn't happen. And so, like – but and those are the two – 
two of the better Mavericks perimeter defenders in this series that are playing big minutes. After that, like if those two can't make an impact on the game defensively, what are you what are you going to do with everyone else? Like Luca is, you know, Luca is not playing great defense. Hardaway, you know, Tim Hardaway is not a good defender. Kristaps is not a good defender right now. Uh, and that that's your starting lineup. And so, you know, Dorian and Maxi kind of have to cover up the warts for the other members of the starting lineup. Sure. And they can't do that, which they didn't do tonight. And I'm not trying to say that that's their fault because that's a tough matchup they have to do. But I'm just saying that's the reality of the situation. That's how you give up 58% shooting uh, to, to a team, even as a team as talented as the Clippers, but still, you know, 58% yeah. shooting in a playoff game. Like, I'm just, I just keep staring at it. Like, that's just crazy. That's a crazy number. And it's a crazy yeah. number the Mavs put up, you know, earlier. It's, it, it's a weird series of offensive numbers. It seems like none of these teams – are particularly interested in defense outside of a quarter or a half. Well, um, and and it, it to me it has to be acknowledged that what it, it was almost a mirror of game 1 for for in terms of, you know, kind of execution where in the fourth quarter of game 1 the Clippers started double teaming Luka and Luka broke their backs by passing out of the double. Kawhi did the same thing. Um yes. what yep. do you still have that that Seth Partnow stat about corner threes that you shared in the Slack? um the about the the restricted area and corner three shots yeah yeah uh yeah clippers took 29 shots in the restricted area and corners combined uh the maps had 16 yeah and marcus morris found a shot like they 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 executed in a way that dallas didn't and also really wasn't the the, the scrambling defense for for the clippers was simply much better but the, the Mavericks tried to do, you know, were in kind of a reverse role and they weren't able to to do things like everybody closed really hard on Rajon Rondo, which was odd. Um, yes. you know, Reggie Jackson, who was inserted into the starting lineup, ended up being the answer for them to, to he shot four of 10 from three. But it was it was just it's one of these things where I'm trying to figure out what they really could have done differently on those plays. And the only answer is maybe not give up, you know, char- like KP was like flying out at Rondo twice, but I, I'm having a hard time being critical about those individual decisions within the flow of a scramble. It's, it's simply better offense. Uh, you know, the Mavs defense was terrible. Don't get me wrong, but like, that's what, that's the execution point. And the Clippers took care of it where they hadn't in the previous two games. Yeah. The Clippers did the thing where I'm, um, I'm, um... I'm curious why they didn't do it earlier in the series. Um, but I'll, I'll get back to that. I, I'm talking about how they guard the Mavs. We're not talking sure. about that. We're talking about guarding the Clippers. Um, the Mavs didn't double Kawhi a lot in game two. Uh, and they kind of let him do what he wanted. Mm-hmm. And they stuck to everyone else. I mean, that was what game two. It was Kawhi and Paul George scored all the points and no one else did anything. Uh, and obviously this game was way different. They doubled and Kawhi handled the doubles much better than he did in game one. And the Clippers actually made shots. Uh, they did not do that in game one when the Mavericks uh, doubled off Kawhi. And they let other guys get going. And I'm not entirely sure why they mixed it up from game two to game three, why they decided to double more. Maybe it was because Kawhi was on, at another level in terms of shot making. I mean, he took 17 shots and missed four. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he was good in game two, but he kind of got weaker as the game went on and he in this game it felt like he like you said this earlier he felt like he was getting stronger as the game went on so maybe that influenced the Mavericks second half decision making in terms of oh well, we got to do something we got to double him but I mean I really would just let him score and and stick to these shooters and stick to these guys on the perimeter because I just don't think those guys I, I just don't think the Mavs are good enough they're not a good enough defensive team to double and rotate and make sure. those rotations as we saw uh, you need really, really high quality defenders locked in and on the same page. And we saw multiple times in the fourth quarter, you know, Kawhi gets doubled and maybe the double was coming from somewhere that it didn't need to. I think I saw a play in the fourth where Kawhi kind of started dribbling in the free throw line and it looked like Luka and KP both collapsed on, onto Kawhi. And it was like, you know, maybe, maybe it looked like only one of them needed to. And, and then that led to an open three. Uh, so I'm a little confused that they kind of, changed up their defense from from game two to game three but also like you know i mean i'm not the one standing courtside watching Kawhi make every single shot over and over like there's just there's a mentality to it that's like okay we have to stop when you're in the heat of the game like you know 
I, I understand that that's a tough that's tough to watch as a coaching staff probably. So I don't know. It's it, it's a hard it's a hard puzzle to solve. Yeah. Well, and and that'll probably be the talk for the next several days. I I do think it's it's worth sort of pivoting to the offense where um, the the other Mavericks. I don't know. I was exchanging people send me DMs all game long and I like talking to people. You know, you guys are welcome. Anybody's welcome to send me a message. I try to respond if I can. You know, this was this is the argument for people who don't really like Luco's heliocentrism. And it's just one where I frankly disagree. Luca played a great game and his teammates did not finish. They shot 10 of 32 from two point range. The rest of the Mavericks, there were you know, he, he had some pretty sloppy turnovers. He had five turnovers, nine assists. But, you know, when a guy scores 44 and is connecting on three like that, at a certain point, it becomes somebody else's job to hit shots. You know, Tim Hardaway really got out of control in that stretch in the first quarter when Luca was out, just kind of taking some wild looks that that really, you know, started the run uh, for the Clippers that, that didn't go down. Um, Brunson... Brunson was good. I mean, he's five of eight from the floor for 14 points, but he was also a negative 19. I know we don't use like single game plus minus, but he got exposed on defense because he's small and him and Richardson both did not see KP on the, on the perimeter multiple times wide open. Now I, I've, you know, I think we should probably finish with some Chris Stapps talk so we don't go too off the rails here, but you know, Porzingis is not just there as a decoy. You got to give the guy a shot now and then. And these guys are hunting paint shots. And Richardson, you know, while he did manage to connect on a few, you know, Richardson, he, he started out two of two and then missed his next three, all of which were like paint attempts. And, you know, we don't, the Mavericks don't pay Josh Richardson to be a creator off the dribble in the lane. Like, get that out of here. That's, that's not his role. Uh, I was very, very frustrated with the rest of the backups. Um, Willie Cauley Stein for, a guy who had a really nice game two had a game three where he committed a flagrant foul, which, you know, is kind of here. It was, it was a good play. I understand why they called it. Um, and then committed a taunting foul and frankly just left Zubots and got owned on the glass for about four minutes in a period of, of possessions that were key to sort of deciding the game late. And, and you just granted, and then there's Dorian Finney-Smith, who was three of ten and had his second straight dud of an offensive performance. Where he, it's it, they need more from these guys. And this was kind of the first game that we've seen the series where there wasn't like an electric performance from a bench player on offense, at least, or just an electric, or just an electric performance from anyone besides Luca. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Luca outscored the starters by himself. I think I'm not doing the math in my head really well, but I think that's right. Mm-hmm. Um, Brunson was tough because you kind of felt like you couldn't take him off the floor because he was making shots. But you're right; he was giving it up on the other end, and defensively, he wasn't very helpful. I mean, the thing that's really tough about the Mavericks is they have a lot of one-way players. Sure, uh, like Willie is on the floor for defense and energy. When you take him out, when you take out Kristaps and you put him in, you're radically changing the spacing on the floor. Like, say what you will about Kristaps, and we will probably get to him when I'm done with my spiel. But even when he's bad, the floor changes in a way that it, it's not when Willie's on the floor, and that's not yeah. Willie's fault. But, you know, it's just – it changes. But they need defense from him. You know, Richardson's the same way. Like, he's not – he is not a threat offensively. I think these, you know, the Clippers are not paying too much mind to him. But I thought toward the end of the third quarter, the the lineup that had Willie and, and Josh in it held up pretty well defensively, you know, compared to what the Mavericks were doing the rest of the game. But they were still trailing because that lineup also wasn't scoring. And then you right. put in Brunson, but you've got Brunson, Luca, and Hardaway in at the same time. At times, those guys can be your three worst defenders in terms of just individual defensive or off, you know, off ball awareness, stuff like that. And it's like, there's a push and pull with some of these lineups where it's like, oh, well, we can't take Brunson out because he's making shots. Well, we can't, we can't, we're not getting stops. We're not getting back in the game. Okay. You know, Richardson or or Colley Stein, you know, let's, let's give them a a shot here. 
uh, all right, we're getting stops, but we're not we're not scoring. So uh, that's that was really that was really tough. I I, I felt that in the second half where I, it almost felt like Rick was kind of at a loss for for where to go because it was either you're making a move that's going to make the offense or you're making a move that's going to make the defense and and they just don't have enough solid two way guys, which yeah. is why Kleba and Finney Smith are so important because those you know and Przingis when he's right like those guys have to be good defenders and, and make their shots and Kleba made his shots but and but that's about it well they were they simply you know they'll they'll be more data to look at tomorrow but the the Mavericks panicked in any non Luka minutes they look completely lost to start the fourth quarter they did the thing which I understand why where they they tried to get Porzingis looks again and one of them resulted in a turnover where they didn't it's like he's he's posted up on the little guy and they just take 10 seconds to get him the ball like there, there's not a lot of urgency on some of these and i know they're probably trying to milk some clock but they were down so it was like what you know i was very confused about what what's what's happening and i get that you know none of them know how to screen that sort of stuff has started <laughs> to drive me crazy like this is where powell not playing like none of them know how to use like brunson even who is an unbelievable pick and roll basketball player he does not use screens most of the time he just kind of runs near it um and and granted i'm not like crushing the guy i'm just sort of seeing i'm saying a thing that i'm seeing and and they just they run these sort of like you know needless like ball back and forth tap plays it, it, and I didn't understand kind of the, the movement and, and they, they just like, they were waiting for Luca to get back out on the floor. And with how some of these guys had played up until that point, you know, I, that was their opportunity to take up and, you know, step up and do some things. And they just didn't. And, you know, it, again, Porzingis is going to get the largest amount of criticism, but, you know, you look at the stat lines of other people like Temi was his worst game of the series. He, he missed every single two point shot he took. Mm-hmm. Um, that's hard to do. Can't stress that enough, people. And that's been big um, for him. He, he was a yes. career high from two this season. Yes. Two-pointers. So that's so that hurt. Huge. And and I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of struggling. Like, I'm sure people sort of will tune in and expecting me to be really hot about this. And when I do the post-game locker room, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of really angry fans. But it, it just felt so it, – it felt like they were in just enough quicksand to not be able to, to get out of it. And – you know, Luca was like Luca played out of his mind, and that was why the game was the way it was. And you know, there's some things to criticize in his game. Like my man, whatever is going on with the free throws, he's got to figure it out. He cannot miss six free throws. He just cannot do it. No, nope. he got nope. to the line 13 times. Like that's fantastic. But if you miss six of them, what's the point? Like a few of them were dumb. Like like he missed he missed the both ends of of a couple of sets and. Like those are wasted possessions at that point. Um, I, I, that that's very frustrating to me. His defense, I thought, was was here. You know, a little column A, a little column B in terms of good bad. But you know, they they needed them on the floor so much that I'm having a hard time being hypercritical about him getting burnt by Rondo on a uh, on a scramble, which happened in the fourth. I'm just yeah. I, I'm I'm not and sure. I mean, is there anything else to really talk about before we kind of get to the the thing that I think everyone will talk about? Yeah, I think it's time because that's a good segue where it's going to be like, hey, you know, we get a lot of why are you killing this guy when this guy is also not contributing in this area? For instance, you know, Luca's defense, which has been hot and cold this season. Well, guys. <laughs> Luke is dropping 44 and hitting uh-huh. seven threes and almost getting, tri- you know, like there's a reason why we might harp on one guy over another when they might both be making the same mistakes is because at least one of, you know, this guy, Luca is doing something on the other end of the floor. Well, and, but, um, but he's getting the opportunity. Like Porzingis isn't getting the opportunity. He goes, no. well, he, he shot 10 times tonight. Well, and that's because. <laughs> I'm just playing devil's advocate. No, here. I know. You know and I, I agree. And I think it's because the Mavericks have decided they're not going to do their their Kristaps special boy offense too much because they know how much that drags everything down. And they, like I said this after game two that I was – I don't know if I said this on the pod. I know I said on Twitter. Um, uh, I was really proud of the Mavericks offense for just running offense and not stopping the game down for five minutes at a time to get KP going. And it was more like – KP, you need to fit into what we're doing and you will get your shots that way uh, or you will not because we can't sacrifice five minutes of a playoff game 
to make you feel like a special boy and give you your mm-hmm. touches and shots. Uh, on the other end of that, like you said, though, the Mavericks cannot treat Kristaps like he's Maxi Kleba, which is frighteningly what they do for long stretches of the game. He did not dive the lane a single time, and I cannot help yeah. but think that that is a coaching decision. Not that's not on Porzingis. Like like Luca kept looking for Maxi with like one of those. I'm sticking my hands up in there like anybody can see me. <laughs> like doing like one of those like like pass fake and then over the top like overhead passes to the to the cutter and. The Mavericks have zero vertical game right now. Zero. And I think some of that is honestly by choice. But I'm just not understanding it because Porzingis is seven foot three. You know, you pay, like Luca can hit him in the hands with his hands eight feet above the air to where all he has to do is turn and dunk. It's probably, it's obviously not that simple because the the, the Clippers have all this length. But I, I'm, you know. Kristaps had one shot in the restricted area tonight. Yeah. Yeah. That's I don't, and that's what I don't. You know, the scheme thing is interesting. That's a scheme that they're telling. That you, yeah. That's interesting because I don't. Then you're, sh- I, I'm struggling because it's like I understand what you're saying, and your devil's advocate is is totally kind of on point in terms of he's not getting the opportunities. But at the end of the day, like they just it, something's got to give. Like they yeah. they've either got to if it's a coaching thing, then they got to figure this out, and if it's a him thing, he's got to figure it out. It, I'm gonna guess it's a little combination of both. Sure. Um, because it he's we've played three games. He's had two horrible, like horrible offensive games. Mm-hmm. Like not just like mediocre. They survived one. Yeah, and he's played horrible defense in every single quarter of this series, except for the two quarters in the second half of game two. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's not going to cut it. And I don't know what it is. Like, like I said, I don't know what the answer is because I don't. I, I like your take on the scheme thing because, like, it's it's too. Like, if he's not doing it, and the coaches are telling him to, then that's like that's different. That's a problem. But him going and standing in the corners. I promise, not something that's, he wants yeah, to do. Because like, that's what they did in the, in a lot of the beginning of the last season before Powell got hurt. Like, uh, yeah, there's there's a guy that I argue with on Twitter all the time, just back and forth about stuff, Jim, who who really tends to, to, to you know, sort of take KP's side in it. And on the offensive stuff, I, I I really, really do agree that they have to, that they're just not using him the right way. And if they're scared of him rolling down the lane, if there's actual concern there, then this is a lost cause. Yeah, what are you going to do if you're not going to roll if you're not going to take the bubble tape off or the you know the bubble wrap off in the playoffs like then you're never, you know, then that's it. I mean, yeah. There's nothing really you can do to go past that. But the thing that sucks is like he's not a good shooter. <laughs> he's not a good shooter. And then, um, like this this reputation stuff right like he's not a bad shooter. He is a good a, shooter for someone of his size and it just morphs into oh he's a good shooter. And he played like some of the shot attempts that he took tonight were those of a shooting guard. Like he one dribble pull-ups. He he again had two free throws. Granted you didn't get a lot of touches. It's hard to kill him like honestly I'm not mad about his offense. Where I am mad about his offense is in the sense of I can see how it directly impacts his defense. He gave a quote tonight. I had it pulled up here. He gave a quote tonight where he said, I'm just frustrated at the moment and I keep and I'm trying to keep my head in the right place and keep playing hard. He does not play hard. He does not play hard. I I want to pivot to the defense because the defense stuff, he he. He physically cannot do the things he used to do. And I do not understand how we're at this point in the year where he's still getting beat on these things. You know, I'm not sure if you've played pickup basketball lately, but you learn pretty quickly when you're at our age that you can't do the shit that you used to do. (laughs) So you hang back. I cannot handle the seven foot three rim protector getting beat on backdoor cuts. It is unacceptable. There was like a three minute or four minute stretch where he got beat on two backdoor cuts and then uh, did a really hard closeout on Nick Batum and got beat by him for a layup. And basically Mm -hmm. he gave up six points basically on his own. Like that wasn't, that wasn't his teammates failure. That was on, you know, two backdoor cuts. That's on you, dude. Mm -hmm. Uh, And 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 he got pulled. He he got got pulled. Colley Stein went in after that. 
I the the rim penetration stuff is not all on him. We said that nope. before. I'm going to say it again. Nope. But after the game, Paul George said talked about his penetration and said mainly it's just attacking. They don't have a rim protector, so just try to get out there and put pressure on the basket. The Clippers do not see him as a rim protector because he's not a rim protector and hasn't been since early March. There was a two week stretch where everybody and their uncle loved telling me that I was a moron. He has not been good since mid March on the defensive end. And I, I, the, the frustrating part to me though, is that I do think there are things that he could do differently and he gets more energized when his shot is going down and he's bouncy and his hands are more active. There was that a game two, the start of the third quarter, he had a couple of blocks and a couple of steals. He didn't mm-hmm. do any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. He didn't do any of it. Cause he's on his heels and, uh, this is this is where I'm trying very hard to be very specific about my criticism because people think I'm just so insanely unfair about him. But I, I these are things where if he can't physically do it, then the Mavericks have to go through tape and with practice with him and show him where he's getting beat so he can not get so he can adjust where he starts. Does that make sense? Because like there's things you can do as a big guy. To, yeah. to not constantly be out of position. Like it's one thing if he gets beat off the dribble because he's challenging a three-point shot. That stuff drives me nuts, but it's also not necessarily fair to put him in the position on the scramble. It's it's this other stuff that I'm talking about where it's the like right cuts. near the rim and he's just not doing his thing. Yep, and that too. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it feels like he's playing like he still has the body that he had in New York before the first ACL tear. Like, you got to imagine in his head on those two backdoor cuts, he's like, I wonder if part of the thing, you know, I'm just spec- – obviously I'm speculating because I can't get inside his brain, but I just wonder if he's in that position because he thinks, well, if they do go backdoor on me, I can recover and block the shot. And that's – he can't do that anymore, or at least he doesn't do that consistently or he can't do that for sustained effort for a month's worth of games or maybe two weeks worth of games. We played games. 34 minutes tonight and he had zero blocks and one steal. Yeah. And three rebounds. Uh, the just... rebounds is a whole other, it's a whole other thing. <laughs> I, I can't talk about it. I'll, I'll be too mad. The fact that, 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 that will fire you up. You said, yeah, you said you weren't fired up, but that will, that conversation definitely will fire you up. I mean, it's, um, it's just, there's gotta be more. And I think he knows it. And I think he's kind of in his own head. This is where him being a really smart guy starts to be very challenging. He gave another quote where he, he's, he thought that what the Clippers were doing was a lot of like random actions and that threw him off and him being thrown off for guy like this is where like he's 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 so calculating he's not reactive he's not a natural he's not like the, this sort of stuff isn't built like like most of the basketball things with Porzingis are not built into him I don't think he's not uh he's much more of a calculating player than he is a guy like Luca often gets described as a guy who plays free like KP does not play free defense or offense. It's, you know, the, the computer processing and, you know, that's fine. It's just, it, it, it kind of showed like it's, it's a limitation to a degree. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, you definitely see a little bit of the Harrison Barnes when Harrison was in Dallas, the computing, uh, the way the reaction kind of time to, to process the game and the, and that la- you know, lack of game feel uh, that we sometimes saw with Harrison, you know, when he would drive to the basket and, and put up a shot against four people instead of making mm-hmm. an easy pass to the corner. Feels like KP maybe has that, but for the defensive end. But yeah, it, I know we're, we're probably running up on time. Yeah, we are. Yeah. But yeah. To, to, to close this out with this conversation with KP, like uh, the Mavericks shouldn't can be concerned. Well, I, I don't want to say the Mavericks, but th- like Mavs fans shouldn't be too concerned and there shouldn't be like a panic. Cause like we said earlier, when you're up to one and you play game four at home, like that's, you're still in the driver's seat. Yeah. Um, but the only thing from this game that, that can, that really like deeply concerns me for the rest of the season series is the Kristop stuff. And I just, I don't know if it's a coaching thing, a him thing, combination of the two. They just, I don't know what the answer is, but they have to get more production than they're getting. And they just, they have to. They cannot win this series if he continually has 14 points on four of 13, nine points on three of 10. They're not, they're they're not going to win the series. They're just not. And 
maybe Tim Hardaway Jr. can get back and start shooting 60% from three in these games. Uh, I mean, he's been, he's been so huge. I wouldn't really put it past him, but I, the, the problem is, is when you see those three for 10, four for 13 games, you're not getting it on the other end. So yeah. he, he has to be more than a, than a floor spacer. He just has to be. And that's what it feels. It feels like he's a floor spacer on offense. And then they give him, they try to throw him a bone for three minutes that Luke is on the bench. And it's really awkward. And it's really weird because the Mavericks don't play that style any other time of the game, except when Luca's off the floor and it's time to walk the ball up, get KP in the post, throw it down to him. Everybody stand and watch. And it's like, what are we I don't know what we're doing. Like they, they got to find a way to get him more involved in the flow of the game instead of these weird stop down possessions where they have to cater to him to try to get him shot shots. I mean, they just have to, and and that'll be the key to me. That's, that's going to be the big thing for the series is what, what can they get out of KP because they can't, he, they can't get what they got out of game one and game and game three. That just can't, yeah. that can't be the norm. Yeah. I mean, the only cause of concern right now, past the immediate things like the kind of bigger picture stuff is like lucas talking post game and it sounds like he has a mild stinger um his oh, neck is, i just did not yeah. notice that during the game for whatever well reason. i mean it's like he's talking about it after he's not really making excuses he's just saying like i felt it like because they had the heating pad and stuff on and they kept talking about that yeah, so i guess I we'll find that. out more about that as, as the day goes on but you know let's get on out of here we got to be back on sunday night there's enough to write about and talk about that we'll uh we'll keep doing this for for those of you who are kind of part-time subscribers to Mavs Moneyball, money i'd appreciate it if you gave me that uh me and josh that that subscription on your podcast feed uh you obviously don't got to listen to us all the time we try to put out a lot of regular content uh please visit mavsmoneyball.com uh, we'll have a lot of writing i'm sure over the next two days um and then we'll be back back with you on uh on thursday night so or i'm sorry on sunday night do you got anything else josh no let's let's get out of here and let's get get going on the site we'll have another jam-packed day or two of content for y'all all right we'll see you guys out there everybody enjoy your saturday and sunday Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, Just go to cars.com. It's magical.